And, um, looking forward to that. We got um, Eric Owens here with us. Barry asked me to introduce Eric uh, this afternoon. And I said, and I got to thinking on the way down from, from White Oak, I said, well, Barry, you might have to introduce me because I haven't been here in so many months. But, uh, but anyways, um, it's good to have Eric Owens here with us. Um, he preached in Georgia for 20-something years down at Avondale um, Congregation and did a great work down there. Um, and so good to have him here with us. He's, um, we, we love Eric so much. He, this is his second time here, I believe. He spoke one time several years ago. And... Uh, we, we had them back today, and I've already booked them for a gospel meeting in 2027 or 8. I can't remember when. Uh, I went ahead and just booked that out. I said, we got to have Eric back uh, for a full gospel meeting so we can hear him all week. But we're thankful that he's kicking off our lectureship. He's now in Texas, just outside of Austin, at the Westside Congregation in Round Rock, Texas. And um, been there for about six months, and he says it's been a good transition so far. So we'll be prayerful for his efforts there in the Austin area. In Round Rock areas, he continues to preach the gospel. Eric's written several books, but I think Eric would say that he want, he most wants to be well known as an established Christian who loves to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and does so in a clear and eloquent way, and easy for us to understand. We're thankful for his work and dedication to the gospel. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have our opening prayer, and I'm gonna do that here in a second. And Kason's gonna lead us in a few songs. After a few songs, Eric will get up and preach to us, and then Philip King will be dismissing us in prayer. So let's have a prayer, and then we'll be entering into our worship hour. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this Lord's Day, this day of the week when we can come together as Christians, where we can come together and worship you. Lord, we pray that everything that we do and say and, and acts of worship this morning and this afternoon will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We're thankful for Eric Owens and him coming our way and him preaching the gospel to us. We're thankful that he has done so much work for in your kingdom. We pray for the work that he's going to continue to do, be with his new work out there in Texas. We pray for us as hearers this afternoon that will be attentive, that we will search the scriptures to make sure that things that are being said are so, and that we will be strengthened from the lessons, that we'll be better Christians because of it. Be with us and continue to keep us safe. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Six hundred sixty. Six hundred sixty. <clears throat> Oh, God. 
694. Stand, please. say thank you again for having us and uh, allowing me to be here with you this morning and afternoon. Also want to say thank you for the wonderful meal. The food was delicious. You have some great cooks here, which obviously creates challenges for self-control at uh, potlucks, but it was delicious. I've been told multiple times, keep us awake. That's not actually something I can do. Sorry, <laughs> but I do understand your struggle with, with the good food and the comfort and so forth, but we'll do the best we can. Our topic this afternoon, how to get your family to heaven. How to get your family to heaven. The phrase how to involves at least three things. Number one, someone to tell you how. Number two, someone to learn how. And number three, instructions that you need to know how. And when it comes to doing something, the truth is nothing can be assumed. In fact, it's not. There are instructions for how to for everything. From the very simple, there are actual instructions on how to brush your teeth, how to prepare a boiled egg, how to run, and how to fill a bathtub with water. To the complex, how to build a house, how to deliver a baby, or how to climb Mount Everest. The more significant a thing is, the greater the instructions are. And we cannot get more significant than how to get your family to heaven. By family, we assume a father, a mother, and children, and therefore some of the how-to involves parenting. How do I get my family to heaven? It is a great question, and I would urge it's a question everybody with a family should ask. 
People in the Bible asked it in one form or another. The rich young man ran to Jesus. He asked him ultimately how to get to heaven. Mark 10, 17 to 22. He ran to Jesus. He was urgent. He addressed Christ as good. He was reverent. He asked the right question. He was interested. He lived a faithful life from his youth, and so he was committed. He only lacked one thing, and it was love. The Bible says Jesus loved him. Verse 21, looking at him, Jesus felt the love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. How saddened our Lord must have been when Jesus loved him to only watch him love something else more than he loved Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He didn't, John 14, 15. It makes you wonder how often God has had the same view. He has loved us so richly and abundantly and so often watches us choose to love something more than him. The first thing with regards to how to get your family to heaven is this. There is some very sobering news with regards to the subject, namely that Jesus taught many people won't get themselves or their families to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. The way to life is straight and narrow and found by few. The way to destruction is wide and broad, and many will just go therein. Jesus also said many religious people won't get themselves or their families to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 beginning, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. They were religious people, but many of them will not go to heaven. The second thing that's noteworthy is there are several reasons why so many people won't get their families to heaven. Among them are, some reasons include, they believe error. 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1 and verse number 2, Peter said, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by way of whom or reason whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. Some people won't make it because they'll believe error. Other people won't get there because, well, they judge themselves unworthy of going. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 13 and verse 45 and verse number 46. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And they spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But, listen to it, seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. There will be others that practice lawlessness, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Some will fall away. They were there. They had the truth. The Galatians are an example. Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, or verse number 1, chapter 1, verse 6. He, Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removing from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach as, preaches any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. By chapter 3 of that book, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth. They had obeyed it. By chapter 5, Paul will say, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. There will be people who won't get to heaven because they were once saved and they fell away. And then there's a group of individuals that won't make it because they never grew. And as a result of never growing, they became unbarren and unfruitful. 
They never added to their faith that progression of which we just spoke. Listen to Peter's words in 2 Peter 1 and verse number 5. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, it's possible to be in the Lord and them not be in you. Peter says, if these things be in you, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, we are to bear much fruit in order to please God. And then there's a group of individuals who won't make it in because they were Christians and they just stopped believing. Paul, or the, the writer of the book of Hebrews, is writing to individuals who are brethren. And he says this in chapter 3 and verse number 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. In chapter 3 and verse 18 of that book, he says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. What's the rest? Well, in the Old Testament, it was Canaan. In the New Testament, it's heaven. And so chapter 4 of that book says, let us therefore fear. Looking backward at the Jews not making it to Canaan, he pivots and looks at his audience and says, now let us fear, lest the promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us the gospel is preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard. There is a third a sobering fact, and that is God won't get most of his children to heaven. God has two kinds of children, as best I can ascertain in Scripture. The first kind are created. The second kind are covenant. Because God forms the spirit of man within him, Zechariah 12:1. And because God makes man in his image for Genesis 1, 26, 27, he is referred to as the father of spirits, Hebrews 12 and verse number 9. And as a result of that, it is God's desire that all men be saved. Every human being is ultimately a child of God by way of creation. He is God's offspring. The result of that is, you'll read passages like 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 4, where with reference to all men, the Bible says God's position is that he would desire all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Said in reverse, 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9, speaking of all men, Peter says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yet, many of God's created children will not make it to heaven. Maybe even more sad is that God's covenant children, many of them won't make it. You see, after you are a created child of God, you can then become, by obedience to the gospel, a covenant child of God. We learn that first from the Old Testament, and then we're warned about it in the New Testament. Many of God's covenant children didn't make it. As we just read in Hebrews 3 and 4, they did not enter because of unbelief. It's not the case, though, that God didn't try to get his children to heaven. He did. Both sets he has tried. To his created children, he gave creation. Psalm 19, 1 to 6, the heavens declare the glory of God. He desires to be known by them. Acts 14, he didn't leave himself without witness. Romans chapter 1, they could see from the creation, his created children, God gave them the creation to illuminate their way to him. But not only that, he gave them revelation. Psalm 19, verse number 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. But not only that, he gave them creation, he gave revelation, but then he gave his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God has to watch and watch and watch as his created children constantly reject his gifts. They look right up to the sun, moon, stars and say it was an accident. They look at the Bible that he gave and they say it can't be trusted. They look to his son and they say he wasn't really who he claimed to be. And God watches many of his created children. They can't come to heaven. What we learn from the Old Testament, we also realize from the New. 
And that is that many of God's covenant children didn't make it to heaven. Not because God didn't try to get them there. To his covenant children, God also gave gifts. In fact, he gave everything to his covenant children. He gave his created children and more. To his covenant children, he gave his presence, the plagues, the Passover, his protection, his provisions, the water, the manna, the quail, his precepts, the law of Moses, his people, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, the kings, the prophets, the priests, the princes. He gave, he gave, he gave. And what did he watch and witness? One of God's great lamentations is when God sounds just like a parent lamenting that his efforts were not realized. It can be found in Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1, where there Isaiah says, Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath the vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and, listen to the pronouns, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vines, and he, everyone is assumed, he built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Listen to God's lamentation regarding his children. What could I have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? That's God asking, what could I have done more for my children? And wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grace, behold, it brought forth wild grapes. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Paul explained that most of them didn't make it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. When you read that section of scripture, you'll want to note the word all, and you'll want to note the word many. Because when you open up the chapter, it will start out talking about how they all passed through the cloud and they all passed through the sea and they all drank and they all ate and they all, all, all. And verse number five will say, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. They did not make it. Why is it so hard to get one's family to heaven, even for God? Number one, it's because of where we're trying to go. Heaven is a spiritual concept. Heaven is a spiritual destination. And in order to get there, you must have eyes to see it and ears to hear it. And therein lies the difficulty from the very beginning. The physical world prevents many from seeing the spiritual world. And there are any number of reasons for that. One of them is the things that are here are exceedingly enticing. And so the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away. But you'd have to have eyes to see it and ears to hear it. But then secondly, the appearance of permanence makes it difficult for people to see it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, as Solomon opens up that book, beginning in about verse number 4, where he begins to talk about the world and about life, and you hear him say things like, one generation comes and another goes, but the earth remains forever. He talks about the water course and how it runs its course from the the, the, the north to the south and how the waters evaporate and go back. He talks about the wind and the earth, and he says, it all remains forever. It sure looks like it. The permanence of the world makes people believe there is really nothing else beyond it. And for a lot of people, the permanence, the appearance of permanence makes them hard to see the spiritual world beyond it. Then there is the immediacy of physical gratification. Spiritual hope must be deferred. Our world is not big on deferment. Spirituality, ultimate joy must be delayed. Why does a man hope for that which he sees? The world is not big on that, and so it's all about the now. Cannot wait for life after this one. And then there's sin and the power of now. Pleasure for a season. Joy right now. Satisfaction right now. Hard for a lot of people to put that off for the spiritual world to come. Mark chapter 10, we talked about the rich young man. Why didn't he take the treasures in heaven? Because he had physical treasures on earth. And that which he had, he just simply could not see that which was beyond it. 
Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 15, talks about three soils, soils in which the seed was planted, and three of them failed. Why did they fail? The cares of this life, challenges and difficulties of this world, the riches of now, all of those soils. Demas, 2 Timothy 4, verse number 16, Demas has forsaken me. Why, Paul, having loved this present world? Why is it so hard for a lot of people? There are so many things here that will prevent them from getting there. But then there is the simply the inability to see it, the unseen. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 16. Paul says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding and eternal glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But you'd have to see that. You'd have to understand that. You'd have to spiritually discern that in order to see it. Then there is sin and the delay of judgment. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse number 11, because sentence against an evil work is not speedily executed, therefore it is fully in the hearts, set in the hearts of men to continually do evil. Some people believe, like the wicked in Psalm 10, God doesn't see, God doesn't know, he'll never judge. There are people who believe that, and so they'll miss out on heaven. Maybe the ultimate reason is because of who has to decide. Getting to heaven is a personal decision. There is no better parent than God. But at the end of the day, even for God, each person must make up his own mind to want to go to heaven. And for many people, God's intended blessings will end up being a curse for them. God has blessed us richly, how? With personal autonomy, with freedom of choice, with the free moral agency, and these blessings were intended to be used by us to come to God, to submit to God. But for many people, they will use those to reject God. How to get your family to heaven? First thing you need to realize is you can't. You can't get your family to heaven. Now, teaching someone to fish that's what we say sometimes. Don't give a man a fish, teach him to fish. But what goes unsaid in that wonderful analogy is that teaching someone to fish doesn't mean he will. It doesn't mean he'll go get a rod and reel. He'll get some bait, go to the water, bait his hook, cast his hook into the water, patiently wait until he gets a bite, successfully reel the fish in, take the fish off the hook, clean the fish, cook the fish, and then eat the fish. Teaching a man to fish doesn't make them a fisherman. No one can really get another person to heaven. There will be no cheating scandals in heaven because no one can fudge your enrollment package. No one can change your transcripts. You can't send up forged community record service. You can't grease the palm of the dean of admissions no one can fast track your application. No one can change your faith history. Entrance cannot be bought. It is a matter of who you know. But the one you must know is the judge of all the earth and he will do right. Getting to heaven is a matter of faith and righteousness. Peter perceived it. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Peter said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Paul professed it. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 25. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there's no respecter of persons. Jesus will preside over it, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may give an account of the things that he has done in his body, whether they be good or bad. And death will provide the meeting, Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it's appointed unto men wants to die after this, the judgment. In order to get to heaven, we must know God and be known by God. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 9, Paul says, For after that you have known God or have been known by God. Jesus said, I will profess to them, I never knew you. It will be difficult because it is personal. 
for every member of your family. Let me suggest or say to every member of every family, please understand, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. You must present yourself to God a living sacrifice. You must put yourself to death. You must die, be buried, and rise. You must walk in newness of faith. You must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You must be faithful to God. You must follow Christ's example. You must follow the Spirit's teaching. Nobody can get that for you. Each person only has one life to live. No one gets to live two. No one can give their life to God for another. If you don't give your life to God in obedience to the gospel, if you don't live faithfully to God for your life, you cannot and you will not go to heaven. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your preacher. You can't blame the elders. You can't blame the world. Peter's exhortation must be heard and heeded. And with many other words that he testified and exhort them saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now all that said, how can I get my family to heaven? First, believe you can. Second, try until you die. Now what can you do? Can't give faith to somebody, so what can you do? Number one, here are some things you can do to help. Number one, learn God yourself. Exodus 34, verse 6 and verse number 7, God tells us who he is and that's who he is. And if you have any other thoughts about God that disagree with what he said he is, then go back, reconsider your position, and own what he says. God says he is good, and so he is. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is forgiving. God is long-suffering. God is righteous. God is just. God is unchanging. For all practical purposes, parents are God in their family to their children. And therefore, learn, learn, learn God, and then teach, teach, teach him if you want to help your children. Number next, learn from Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9, and practice it. The section of scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is about parents, not children. We almost read the passage sometimes, and we act as if parents and children have an equal part to play in the passage, and it's just not true. This section is about parents and their actions toward their children. The word son appears three times, verse number two. Children, one time, verse number seven. The word Israel appears more than children, twice, verse three and verse four. And the word house appears more than children, twice, verse seven and verse nine. In fact, as you read the passages, focus on the words like thou and thine and thee and you and your. The children aren't talking in the text. They're hearing the parents talk. The children are learning as much by observation as they are by instruction. The frontlets, the hands, the head, the heart are all the parents. The text emphasizes learning from God and doing what he taught and then parents doing that in front of their children. Listen to the text of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and note the emphasis. Now these are the commandments, the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded you to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou, and thy son, and thy son's sons all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that flowed with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and now that they're there, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them 
when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou, who is walking and sitting and talking? Those are the parents. You're the one walking. You're the one sitting. You're the one talking. You're the one lying down. You're the one rising up. And what are you doing as you do that? You're teaching diligently to your children. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house. How many times have children told, or parents told the children who the house belongs to? This is my house. Well, that's the point. It is your house, and because it is, Write it on the doorpost. Put it on your hands. Put it between your eyes. Say it over and over. It's your house. That's precisely right. And if the goal is heaven, what are they seeing and learning in your house that is directing them there? Number two or three, present heaven properly. Heaven is a place that's real. God created it and he lives there. Heaven is where Jesus is. I go to prepare a place. Why stand ye here gazing? The same Jesus that was taken up will come in like man. Heaven is populated. The heavenly hosts are there. Holy, 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 they cry. It's a place to be desired. You do not want to go to hell. Something has gone terribly wrong if the conclusion is, I'll just go to hell and party with my friends. Something has gone terribly wrong. Heaven is a place to be desired, and hell is to be avoided at all costs. Tell your children that heaven is a proper end of life. It's where we're supposed to be. The purpose of life, Acts chapter 17, verse 27, is to seek the Lord and find him. Once you find him, the point of life then is to be transformed into his image from glory to glory. Second Peter 1, 3 and 4. The end of life. What's the proper end of my life? Heaven. The purpose of it, seek the Lord. The point of it, become like the Lord. The end of it, let's go home with the Lord. Second Timothy 4, 6 to 8. Tell your children it's a place that's attainable. Stop presenting heaven as a place for the exceptional few. Heaven is for the faithful. Hebrews 11 and verse number 13, the Bible says, these all died in faith. Not the selective few, not the exceptional, no. These all died in faith. Believe it yourself and teach your children with confidence and assurance that the faithful people go to heaven. We often emphasize that only faithful people go to heaven. Can I add and ask that we also emphasize all faithful people go to heaven? There is not a faithful person that's ever lived that'll miss heaven. Not a single one. Heaven is a place where your presence is expected and anticipated. If your name is written in the book of life, you're expected to come home to heaven. Revelation 21 and verse 27, the Bible says, And there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you are expected to come home to heaven. In fact, according to Peter, your reservation is being held. People wait six months, sometimes to a year. There's some new trendy restaurant that's opening, and I can't wait to get there. And then they finally show up. Can you imagine it? I'm ready to be served. This is swanky. I've heard about this. It's going to be fantastic. You meet the garçon, and he opens up the book and says, oh, I'm sorry. Your name's not in the book. But I made a reservation. I'm sorry. We have no record of your reservation. I demand to see the manager. I am the manager. You cannot eat tonight, but we have an opening about five more months away. You know what? No Christian will have that scenario when it comes to heaven. No, when you obey the gospel, your name gets written in the book of life. 
And then as you grow in grace and knowledge and walk in the light and live faithfully, there is only one place that destination can end. And according to Peter in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4, these words are written, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, grab it, reserved in heaven for you. After your faithful life, when you arrive on the shores of eternity, no one there will be surprised to see you. Your presence is expected and anticipated. There would be no other place for you to go. When the Lord returned to heaven after his triumph over death, when he arose and went back home, he was met not with shock and surprise. He was met with anticipation and expectation. And so will it be for every faithful child of God. If you want to get your family to heaven wherein you can help, number four, practice your faith. The best we can do for our family is to practice the faith we possess, we profess. Husbands, love your wives, Ephesians 5. Wives, reverence your husbands, Ephesians 5. Children, obey your parents, Ephesians 6. Faithfully attend worship services. Serve your brothers and sisters. Pray persistently. Be benevolent and do good to all men. Guard your heart. Tame your tongue. Temper your temper. Give generously. Study the scriptures. Shine your light. Be transformed, not conformed. Let it be known and clearly understood that I believe in the faith and I'm going to practice it as faithfully and fervently as I can. What an example you'll be to your family if you do. Getting to heaven won't be accomplished by many but it can and will be accomplished by all who practice the faith. Parent like God number next. Learn from God and emulate him if you're parenting. Be giving to your children. You open up the scriptures. Genesis chapter 1, start at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first disposition, the first action of God, the first thing we read him doing is giving. God doesn't owe anybody anything, and yet he gave the world. God's creation is a gift from the father to his children. In fact, God says to Adam and Eve, see, I've given you all. May every child know that their parents will give them their all. You open up the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and it reads just like an anticipating family parent waiting on the arrival of children. That's how it reads. Days 1 through 5, all preparatory, all planning and preparation. Isaiah 45, 18, the Bible says he formed it to be inhabited. He didn't make it in vain. He made it to be inhabited. When's it going to be inhabited? Day 6. Days one through five, preparing for the arrival. That's exactly what parents do. They learn that they're pregnant, and then they start rejoicing. And as soon as they learn, guess what they start doing? They start preparing. Nine months away, we got time. Time for what? Time to get the room right. Time to get the clothes together. Time to get the everything prepared. He can't use any of it. Doesn't matter. It'll be here when he arrives or she arrives. Parents give to their children, not grudgingly, not hesitantly, not angrily. They give to their children because they love them and because they're a blessing from above. An eternal soul we got from heaven, and heaven wants the child back. And so we give you our all. That's what parents do. Give them your time. Give them your energy. Give them your heart, your strength, your wisdom, your money. You're going to do that whether you want to or not. Give them your money. Give them your goods. But ultimately, give them your God. Be faithful before your children, not flawless. We say it, but we struggle to believe and live it. We say it, but we struggle to model it. We say things like, nobody's perfect. And then we go try to be perfect in front of our children and we mess it up. Instead, be faithful. Be faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. That's Revelation 2.10. Walk in the light as he is in the light. That's 1 John 1.7. Fight the good fight of faith. That's 1 Timothy 6.12. Faith is trusting God and doing what he says. Do that. 
Teach them and model before them. We trust God. Son, daughter, I want you to trust God because I trust God. In fact, I trust in the Lord with all my heart and I will not lean into my own understanding. In fact, in all of our ways, we'll acknowledge him and let him direct our steps. That's Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. When it comes to marriage and parenting, is the goal is heaven? Trust in the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Parents, trust God. Don't rely on your own thoughts. Show and say to your children, in this family, we trust God. When? When things are good, we trust God. We thank God. What? Well, when things are bad, we trust God. When things are hard, we trust God. When we suffer loss, we trust God. When we're sick, we trust God. When we're well, we trust God. When everyone and everything is going crazy around us, we trust God. Natural disaster strike, we trust God. Horrible atrocities occur, we trust God. The world is falling apart, burning on fire, we trust God. The world is divided racially, we trust God. We don't concede to the world, we don't conform to the world, and we don't cry every time something happens in the world. We trust God. We were growing up, there was a saying in the neighborhood, it went something like this, if you cry, what the baby's gonna do? <laughs> so many parents are falling apart in front of their children. Can't function in front of their children. And then tell their children, the Lord is our God. Really? If he is, then show them what confident faith looks like. We know this world is not our home. We know the whole world lies in wickedness. We know light and darkness are incompatible. And so, so show your children mature, spiritual, faithful, strong mothers and fathers who trust God no matter what so we can go to heaven when it's all over. Be genuine, honest with your children. Our family and children need to know that we are not perfect. And we have to stop telling them we are striving for perfection. We're not. Now, I know we know the word means completion, not sinlessness, maturity, not sinlessness. Once we sin, we can no longer strive for sinlessness. By definition, once you sin, you can't be sinless. Try as you might. It's why you need Jesus. Instead, tell your children the truth. And Christianity is not about human perfection. It's about Christ's perfection. And Christianity is not about our goodness. It's about God's grace that allows us to be better. And Christianity is not about our completeness. It's about being made complete in Christ. Christianity is not about flawlessness. It's about faithfulness. The truth is we fail we fall, we stumble, we struggle, and sweetheart, you will too. We're not perfect. We sin. We don't always have it together. We mess up sometimes. We get down sometimes. Sometimes we argue. Sometimes we fight. But we are trying. And God forgives. And God is gracious and God is kind and merciful and long-suffering. And, and that is our motivation to continue to try. Tell them and show them that it's God's goodness that leads us to repentance, Romans 2, 4. Not his anger and not his wrath, but his goodness. And that because of the hope we have, we purge ourselves from sin. We don't walk in it. We don't practice it, 1 John 3, 1 to 4. Now, let me say very quickly, don't go crazy and tell them every bad thought, word, and deed you've ever committed. They are not peers or counselors or confidants. They are immature children, and so they'll use it against you. <laughs> and don't make them your friends and share all your news and notes on your spouse. They are immature children. They will pit you against each other. What I'm saying is be genuine and honest to get your family to heaven. Be loving to your children. Love like God. Love unconditionally, love with un, without limit. Love instructs, it teaches, it corrects for our good. Love loves all the time. So love them even when or especially when they fail. Luke 15 is in the Bible for a reason. The sinners and the publicans came home. That's the point. You start to read about the sheep and the coin and the boy, you might miss the first two verses of the chapter. 
The first two verses, Jesus is sitting with tax collectors and sinners, and they come to him and say, this man received the sinners. That's the point. The sinners have come home. Thank God for that. Can your children come home if they get in the sin? What happens when they go to the far country if they go to the far country? What happens if they find themselves face down in a pig's pen? Are they too dirty for your righteousness? Are they too gone for your goodness? Or is there a light on at the house and a heart in that house that they know? I have gotten myself into something that my parents never wanted me to get into. And I have done things and seen things that my parents would shudder to think or hear from me. But if I come to myself and go home, but if I could summon the strength and the courage to get up, if I could finally tell the world, no, y'all are wrong, and they do love me. And if I could drag myself back to my house, my parents would come out and they would hug me and they would embrace me and they would have me back and they would forgive me and restore me. Do your children know that? Because that boy knew if I could get back to my father, he would have me back. That's God having sinners back. May your children know you love them so much that while, yes, I would rather you sit with me in worship and never go to the far country, and while I can't come to the far country with you because the father didn't leave the house, but if you'll come back, I'll kill the calf, I'll get the robe, I will get the shoes and I will get the ring and I will celebrate your return so we can go to heaven. God didn't prevent his son from leaving home, but he sure welcomed him back. Love leaves the light on and the welcome mat out. Encourage your children, God does. You could just as well put this epithet across scriptures. Yes, you can. That's God's encouragement. Abraham, offer me your son. I know you can. Job, you're going through trial, but I know you can endure. Yes, you can. Moses said, I can't go back to Egypt. God said, yes, you can. David, you can defeat a giant. Yes, you can. Joshua, you can lead my army after Moses. Sarah, you can have a child. Caleb, you can take this mountain. Peter, you can come back after denying me. And Saul, you can change and become an apostle. And the reason you can is because I will be with you every step of the way. You know why God goes through all that he goes through with his children? so he can get them to heaven. Forgive your children if you need to. That's what God does. If we had nothing else to say about God, it would be that God forgives. Psalm 103 makes it abundantly clear. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our iniquities from us. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, God is pleading with his children so they can come home to heaven. The beginning of the relationship, the rules are for our good. The relationship is based on love. The world gave itself to sin, and God was ready to forgive, willing to forgive, desirous to forgive, promised to forgive, and in Christ ultimately did forgive. How do I get my family to heaven? It's not easy. It's difficult. It's challenging and it's complex. Getting to heaven also is personal. Each person must decide that he or she wants to go to heaven and then give themselves to God and the way which leads to heaven. It wouldn't be a bad idea to sit down with your family around the table and just ask, does everybody here want to go to heaven? Does everybody here want to go to heaven? And if so, what are we all willing to do to get there? 
Getting to heaven is certainly possible. It's probable. It's anticipated. It's expected. It's a prepared place for a prepared people. In fact, there will be so many people in heaven, it will be impossible to count them. Heaven will be populated by an innumerable host. Revelation 7, 9. I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, If you have obeyed the gospel, you can and you are expected to be among them. In order to get home to heaven, then just keep following the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. Just keep following Jesus. Obey the gospel. Eat the bread. Drink the water. Imitate the example. Follow in the footsteps. You'll arrive in heaven. Do all you can to get your family to heaven. But if no one else wants to go, then make sure you get yourself to heaven. And I'm going to beg us to please stop telling people you can't go to heaven by yourself because that's just not true. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about building on foundations. And he says, a man's work will be tried, and it could be lost, but he himself will be saved. Oh, we'd love to take as many as we can with us. But at the end of the day, you've got to want to go yourself. And if nobody else goes, Let the Lord see you come home. Not a Christian, become one. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Change your heart and your mind. Confess his name and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And let God save you. And then you let your light so shine and try to invite and plead and beg with whosoever will to come along too. But make sure you get to heaven. We can help you in any way. We invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. also stayed awake. How about you, right? Yes. Brother Eric, thank you so very much. I want to go to heaven, and I want my family to go to heaven with me. And my, how we've been edified and encouraged in that regard this afternoon. What a powerful sermon. 
And uh, we're so glad that we had this opportunity today to hear uh, Brother Eric Owens preach to us. And again, for the guests that he brought, we are so grateful. Others of you in our uh, community that uh, are with us today, we're thankful for your presence. Looking forward to more of our brethren being with us Monday and Tuesday evenings. And I hope and pray also that those of us who are members at Riverbend will encourage those that we know that are neighbors and friends and family members to come out and be part of the services here the next three nights. Brother Josh Cantrell will be our speaker tomorrow evening. Now, Brother Eric and I, we, we would call each other contemporaries, you know, we, even though I'm a little bit older than he is. But... Uh, now, Josh, I, I sometimes say, old Josh is one of my boys. I had him in school, uh, and uh, it's been good, I know, for Eric and I both to see uh, Josh and others like him grow and mature in the faith, and I'm just thankful he can be with us tomorrow night. I appreciate Austin, for, uh, Austin Fowler for lining up this particular series. Uh, I didn't do it. Austin did it, but I'm thankful to be a part of it. And then... Uh, uh, tomorrow night we'll meet at 7, Monday through Wednesday. So plan on being here. And I am glad that uh, though Eric will have to go back to Texas soon, uh, I'm glad that he can spend just a little bit of time with his mother and with others that uh, he loves so very much that are in the, the area close by. Well, we're going to dismiss for the day. Have an enjoyable afternoon. We'll have a closing song and then we'll have our dismissal prayer. And we'll look forward to being together tomorrow evening. Kaysen, come and lead us in the closing song. The first and last verse, 826. <clears throat> when the Savior calls, I will Our God in heaven, we praise you and thank you for the chance to be here today and for the edification and fellowship that we get through the opportunity of this lectureship series, Lord. And God, we please pray for safe travels for those who have uh, come here to, to be with us, Lord, and for their safe travel back home, Lord, and be with those in this body, Lord, that have different struggles and concerns, Lord, with health and other issues, Lord, that they're facing in their day-to-day -day lives. And God, we pray that we can use the, the things that we've heard here today and, and that you would give us the continued conviction and wisdom, Lord, to help our families and those around us complete your will, Lord, for us and, and make it back home, Lord, where we belong. God, be with us throughout this week and carry us back here the next couple nights to 
further get into your word, Lord, and what your will is for our lives, Lord, as Christians. Forgive us when we mess up, Lord. God, help us to remember that we are your children and to rise above the, the concerns and anxieties that go on in this world, Lord, and that are, seem to be more pervasive in our culture, Lord, and help us to be the lights in this world as Jesus called us to be. God, we pray that the things that we do are accordance with your will, Lord, and we know that your will will always be done. And In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.